Well, good morning, Discovery Church. How are you doing this morning? I want to first of all thank you for listening to the prompting of the Lord and getting here today. Many people, uh, they, they did not, and uh, there's a lot of reasons people don't go to church. But, uh, yeah, the gators lost, that would be one. But, you know, other than that, I, I can't think of a really good reason other than that. Yeah. Uh, but I, we're here, we're going to kick off uh, a new teaching series called Short Stories. And before we go any further, though, I want to, to pray. So would you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, we, we thank you for, for getting us up and getting us here this morning. And uh, Lord, we come here this morning to ask you to remind us and help us understand what is in your word and how it applies to us and how our lives can more reflect you. And Lord, it seems that in this world that we live in, things are, are just, have just gotten sideways. This nation, things have gotten sideways. So we need your Holy Spirit, Lord, to, to come and lead us and to, and to guide us in understanding that that it doesn't matter who sits in the big chair in the Oval Office, you are on your throne above them. They think that they are powerful and, 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 and they think that they have this high position, but Lord, we know we need you to remind us that they will be dust balls on the pages of history shortly, but you will still reign on your throne forever and ever and ever. And Lord, we also understand and need you to remind us that we as a nation don't need a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent. What this nation needs is you. We need to turn our eyes back on you. And so, Lord, I am asking you to pour out your Holy Spirit on us here today to convict us, to lead us, back to you. Reveal yourself today through your word, Lord. We love you. We pray these things in the name of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Are we ready? Are we ready? We're going to be in Matthew chapter 13. So if you want to turn there in your Bible or your device, whatever, when you get to Matthew chapter 13, would you just shout out God? Got it. All right. Here we go. Let's jump in. I'm going to read the first nine verses. On that day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. Such a large crowd, large crowds gathered around him that, that he got into a boat and sat down while the whole crowd stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, Consider the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seed fell on rocky ground where, where it didn't have much soil and it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it was scorched and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns and, and the thorns came up and choked it. Still other seed fell on good ground and produced fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. Let anyone who has ears listen. Amen. All right. Jesus, Jesus uh, preached and taught in the synagogues. And, and we've seen in previous chapters that he was met with opposition. And Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and, and the, all the religious leaders, they tried, to, they tried to trap him. They accused him. They ridiculed him. They were in open opposition to what Jesus was teaching in the synagogue. In the synagogue doors, they weren't closed. They weren't closed, but the synagogue doors were closing. So Jesus simply went from the synagogue, and we're told, he's now teaching at the seashore. 
And, and that seems like a minor point. Uh, but, but what we need to take away from this, this, this little minor detail is anyone who has a real message and a real desire to tell it will find a way to deliver it. They wouldn't let him go in the synagogues without giving him a whole bunch of grief. He said, fine. The crowds will follow me out to the seashore. That's where I will teach out there. In verse 3, we're told that he told, he told them many things in parables. Now, I, I know that this series is called Short Stories, but a parable is more than just a story. In fact, it comes from two Greek words, ballo. You Greek, um, you Greek scholars don't make fun of me because my Greek is really rusty. But it's, it's, it's from the verb ballo, which means to throw or to place or to lay, and para, which means alongside. So the idea behind a parable is to lay one thing next to another thing for comparison. And for Jesus, it was laying a spiritual or a moral truth alongside physical events, physical examples that people would be familiar with so they could understand understand what it was he was saying. That's a parable. And we aren't told in, in, in the scripture, but I wonder if, uh, if there might have been somebody out there sowing seed when Jesus began this parable. And he said, consider the sower. And everybody look, and there's a guy out there scattering seed, walking, just scattering seed. I wonder, and we're not told, but I like to put myself in that position to where I can visualize Scripture. And then in verse 10, the disciples say, why are you speaking to them in parables? Because this is all new to them. Up until now, Jesus hasn't really taught in parables. But, but he, they, they want to know. And so in verse 11, Jesus tells them, he says, because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you to know, but it has not been given to them. And then in verse 13, he says, that's why I speak to them in parables. Because looking, they do not see. And hearing, they do not listen or understand. So how is it? How is it that the disciples... They knew the secrets of heaven. They knew the secrets of the kingdom. How come they knew, but these other people, these crowds, they didn't know? Let me, let me tell you if I can explain it. The Holy Spirit is given to us when we become followers of Jesus. When we commit to him, we get the Holy Spirit to come stay in us. The Holy Spirit is the one that teaches. He is the one that reveals to us the secrets of heaven. God wants us to understand these things. God wants us to live by these things. And he sends the Holy Spirit to instruct us and to teach us. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2. 9 and 10. He says, but as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived, that's the secrets of the kingdom, God has prepared these things for those who love him. Verse 10, now God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit, since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. It's the Holy Spirit. And so this is why Jesus tells them, the secrets of the kingdom have been given to you, but not to them. You see, these di disciples, all of these disciples, all the disciples except for Judas, can't leave him out, all of the disciples, 11 out of the 12, are committed to Jesus. They're committed to following him. He's taught them these secrets and they understand these secrets because the Holy Spirit has revealed them to him or to them and they get it through the Holy Spirit. You see, we forget that as believers, the same power, the same power that scattered the stars in the sky and hung the planets in their places lives in us through the Holy Spirit. The same power. It is through the Holy Spirit. The power of the plant is not in the plant. The power of the plant is in the seed. The power of God 
It's been the seed of his word revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. That's how the disciples understood it. That's why Jesus is teaching in parables. He's trying to get the crowds to understand and get on the same page. And then in verses 18 through 23, he gives an explanation of the parable. Now, now all true believers in this parable are the sower. Every one of us, if you are a true believer, you are a sower of the seed. And Jesus gives us four types of soil that we will be scattering our seed in. Now remember, the way that they planted seed was they just grabbed it out of the bag and threw it along the way. That was, that was how they sowed their seed. And so he's telling us there's four different kinds. So let's look at the first one is the unresponsive hearer. And we see that in verses 18 and 19. So listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one sown along the path. Now, now the path, the path would be where people walk to get through the crop fields. They were through fairs. And uh, you remember um, back in chapter 12, Jesus and the disciples, they were walking along the path through the green fields, we're told. They were hungry and they picked some. That would have been one of these paths. A lot of people would have walked on these paths. And the dirt would get packed down and packed down and sunbaked and rained on and sunbaked some more. And it got very hard and the seed couldn't penetrate it. That's the, that's the path. That is the condition of some heart. They are hard and they are unresponsive. They don't want to hear the word. They don't want to receive the word. They don't understand the word because they don't have the Holy Spirit to reveal the meaning and the wisdom and the instruction of the word. What they have is God preparing their hearts or not. We can allow God to work in our lives or we cannot. That, God says, is up to us. And that's the condition of their hearts. Proverbs 1 7, fear of the Lord tells us fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. Psalm 14 1 says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and they, are vile, they do vile deeds. There is no one doing who does good. In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, Paul tells us, but if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Verse 4, in their case, the God of this age, that's, that's Satan, the devil, our enemy, uh, the evil one, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That was me at one time. Maybe it was you at one time. Maybe that describes you today. The glory of God has been veiled and you don't see it. But that was certainly me at one time. These verses, they, they describe an unresponsive person. Somebody that doesn't want to hear that. Un, unresponsive people, uh, for they are, they're self-sufficient, self-satisfied, many times self-righteous. They have been blinded by Satan and they think that they know best and they despise the wisdom and the instruction that is only found in the word of God. And we are to be sowers to, of the seed. In that type of soil as well. The second type of soil is the superficial here. Verses 20 and 21. And the one sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, but he has no root and is short-lived when the stress or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he falls away. 
Now, the rocky soil, it isn't, it isn't soil that has a bunch of rocks in it because the farmer would have removed those. What, what, what it, Jesus is describing is underneath, a couple inches underneath the surface, there's a layer of limestone. It's all over Israel. And there's just this little layer. And, and, and the, the sower of the seed is sowing seed and some of it falls on that. Sometimes shallow acceptance of the gospel is caused by shallow evangelism. They hold out and hold back on the blessings received through the salvation of, of and living for the Lord, salvation by the Lord, salvation living for the Lord by hiding and even denying the cost of the gospel, the work of the gospel, the, the commitment that the gospel requires of us. And there is a price for that gospel. I want you to know that Discovery Church does not operate that way. Week after week, you will hear from this very stage, there is a price that we as believers pay to live the gospel. That price is our self-sufficiency. We're not self-sufficient and independent. To the contrary, to the contrary, we are dependent on the all-sufficient God Almighty. We're not self-satisfied. Our satisfaction comes from the provision and the protection and the promotion of our Lord God Almighty. He is the one. He is the one that gives us our satisfaction. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Paul said he's got someone or something that is really giving him fits. He calls it a thorn in his side. And he asked the Lord three times to remove it. And the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in weakness. 2 Timothy 3.12 tells us, in fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. No maybe to it. No maybe. You will be persecuted. There's no doubt about it. And that's another cost we pay. People, people will try to trap you. They will make fun of you. They'll find fault with you. They'll point out your weaknesses. They'll point out your past decision. But our weakness is God's strength perfected. If we allow him. The heart that is the rocky, rocky soil, it, receive, it receives the, the gospel immediately, but eventually the, the people determine that the cost is too high. I don't want to be made fun of. I don't want to be made trapped in a corner. I don't want them trying to ridicule me. That cost is too high. And the reason they, they say it's too high is because they haven't grounded themselves in the word of God and they fall away. They don't give they don't give up the self-sufficient life completely for a dependent life on Jesus Christ. They, have heard, they haven't heard or they don't believe God when he tells us in 1 Peter 5.10 through the Apostle Peter, he says, The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. So rather than stay with it and persevere through it, when this pressure comes, the, pers the persecution comes, they check out. And God is saying, I want to get you through this. I will get you through that. That is why at Discovery Church, we do not believe in, nor do we practice shallow evangelism. Because we want people to know that there is a cost to being a fully devoted follower of Jesus. There is a cost. But we also want people to understand there is a reward for living for the all-sufficient, all-powerful God. We want them to understand both sides of that coin. 
The third type of soil. The third type of soil is the worldly hearer. hearer. Look at uh, verse 22. Now the one sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the worries of the age and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. The worldly hearer's heart is so concerned with the things that are going on in the world uh, that the seed gets choked out before it can produce fruit. Notice, Jesus does not say that it doesn't put down roots. He says it doesn't produce fruit. The worries of the world get in the way of a life lived in Jesus. We worry about, about our future to the, point, to the point that if we're honest, if we're honest, it consumes us. It has consumed me in the past. We're no longer content with what God has given us, to, which is today. We're no, longer, we're no longer content with that. We're consumed with what tomorrow might bring. What can I get more tomorrow? What can I do better tomorrow? Where can I go tomorrow? Worry about today. That's what Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, seek first the kingdom of God. And all of these things will be provided for you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough going on. Today has enough issues. Today has enough worries. You don't need to worry about tomorrow. Take that tomorrow. Worry about today, today. We get so involved in the news that, especially in this election, so it drives me nuts. But we get so involved with the news and, and planning our future and, 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 oh, what if this person gets elected? What's that going to mean? What if that person gets elected? What difference does it make? It doesn't matter who's in the Oval Office. I know who sits above them. That's all I need to know. And he has promised to take care of me and get me through it. But we get so involved with that. We get involved with the future and we get involved with the job and our social life and we begin to get away from prayer and reading his word and being part of a small group. Now, I'm not saying watching the news, plan, making a plan, getting together with some friends. I'm not saying those are bad things and you shouldn't do them. That's not at all what I'm saying. They are not in and of themselves bad. But what we have to ask ourselves is what position do they occupy in your life? Do you shut the news off to read the word? Do, 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 you, do you say, hey, look, you know, we, we, we've gone out as, as, as friends. We've been out, you know, to dinner two, three times this week. I, yeah, I'm, I'm staying home or I'm going to small group tonight. You want to come to small group with me? Let's socialize. Do we do that? I had a friend one time that told me, I don't need to go to church. I, I, when I go out fishing, I, I can worship God when I'm out there sir, fishing. And I said, really? Yeah. I said, when was the last time you were out there fishing and you broke out in worship of God? He said, yeah, I have. And I said, exactly. Exactly. So, so, so what I'm saying is we get so preoccupied with these things, these things that they take the place of Jesus in our lives and we don't need to worry so much by them and get consumed with them. Yet yeah, that's what culture wants us to do. That's what our society tells us to do. Revelation 12, 9 calls Satan the one who deceives the world. The one who deceives the world. The Greek word for deceive means to cause to wander, go astray, mislead. That's Satan. In John 8, 44, Jesus calls Satan a liar and the father of lies. And if you take those two verses together, then we see that Satan and his lies are behind our worries for today, the worries for tomorrow, what's going to happen, where's my money coming from, all of that stuff that is Satan deceiving us. And if you take them together, you'll also see that Satan and his lies are behind the thinking, if I only had more, I would, and you fill in the blank, whatever whatever floats your boat. But that's Satan and his life. And we become consumed with that stuff. 
We absolutely become consumed with it. And we get consumed about the worries of the age and getting more. And, and we begin to wander to Satan. Satan deceives us and, and we begin to wander away from our faith. We spend more time thinking and acting on those things than we do on reading and meditating on the word, prayer, or gathering with people that will help us stay focused on God and focused on his word and focused on living for him and seeking first his kingdom in righteousness. And then we wonder, where's my joy? Where's my peace? Where's my contentment? Where, where did it go? You forsake forsook it for that. You gave up today's joy and contentment for tomorrow's worries. And they ain't even here yet. So the fourth type of soil that Jesus tells us about is the receptive hearer. Verse 23. But the one sown on the good ground, this is the one who hears and understands the word, who does produce fruit and yields some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. Jesus tells us about this type of soil, this type of hearer, to encourage us. To encourage his disciples, yes, yes, but to encourage every person of every time that is a sower of the seed. He's telling us that despite the hardness and the shallowness and the thorniness of the hearts that are out there, there are good soil hearts there to be sown in. The one whose heart that God has been preparing and is ready to receive the seed. The one who has come to the conclusion, just like I did, maybe just like you did, I came to the conclusion, I've made a mess of things. I have got this thing so upside down, it'll take a team of people to get it straightened out. I said, I have made a mess of things. There has to be something better than the struggle I'm experiencing now. There's got to be something better. Life cannot be meant to be lived like this. The receptive here is the one who's taken an honest look at their life. And they see that, 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 that God has shown them unbelievable grace and mercy and they don't deserve either one of them. And yet God gives it to them. They didn't deserve it. There are always people that God has been preparing to hear his gospel. There are always people. God's working in their lives and, and preparing their hearts and they're waiting for all they're waiting for is someone to sow the seed. And Jesus says, that is you church. Yes. You sow the seed. Yes. I am the seed. You sow the seed. And that's what they are, they are waiting for, just someone to sow the seed. That word understands that we read, it means to gain insight. They've gained insight. A receiver hears and has connected the dots in their life and the decisions they've made in their life. And, and they've connected that. And they see that God has been working in their life. They recognize that God has been working in their life and moving in their life. They've gained insight into a life walking with the Holy Spirit as a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Now Christianity, uh, a life that we live in Jesus can only be understood from the inside, from the heart. That's why I refer to these types of soil as the heart. A life lived by and in faith will produce fruit. Do you see that? He says it's thrown on the good ground. He hears it. He understands it. Who does produce fruit? There you go. It will produce fruit. Not maybe. It will. Some 100, some 60, some 30 of what was sown. The, the, Jesus is not making a point about the amount. The amount is not important. The point is, if we are committed sowers of the seed, we will produce fruit. That simple. In John 15, verses 4 and 5, Jesus says, Remain in me, and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. Verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. 
the one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. That is what Jesus is saying. He is calling us to produce fruit. A fully devoted follower of Jesus is a sower of the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not only by word, but by the way we live. Both ways is how we sow that seed. And here at Discovery of Church, sowing seed is important to us because Jesus tells us to sow seed, produce fruit. And the only way that we can produce fruit is if we sow the seed. In fact, it is so important to us at Discovery Church that one of our core values, one of the very things that we exist for is we value the lost. And you wonder, well, how can you value a, a heart, a shallow, a thorny heart? How can you, how can you value somebody that rejects God or, or couldn't care less about him, doesn't want to hear about him? And the answer is very simple. There's two, there's two reasons that, that they are value the lost. Two reasons. First of all, uh, Jesus hung on the cross just as long for them as he did for me and you. Don't forget that part. Secondly, we don't know how God is working in their life. You don't know what God is doing to prepare them to hear the gospel. Our God is omnipotent. He is all powerful. Do not forget our God can soften a hard heart. He can deepen a shallow heart. He can weed a thorny heart. We can't see into someone's heart. That's God's territory and his alone. In case you didn't know it, we don't sit high enough to be able to look into somebody's heart. We aren't called to determine the type of soil. We are called to sow the seed. The soil, that's God's department. That's what we're learning through this parable of the sower. I, I want to, there's an old saying that says, you can count the apples on a tree, but who can count the apples in the seed? You ever heard that? Well, let me, let me explain it to you or, or illustrate it this way. How many of you here today, there weren't many in the first service, I was surprised. How many of you here today, put your hand up if you heard of Billy Graham? You know who the guy named Billy Graham is? Yeah, got a few more in this one. Good, good, good. Now, how many of y'all have heard of Edward Kimball? Boom, we got one. All right. Don't you spoil it. <laughs> Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher. He taught a boy's Sunday school class in the middle 1800s. He, he prayed for each and every boy every day by name. He wanted to lead every one of them to Jesus. Well, one of the boys in his Sunday school class didn't quite understand the gospel. Didn't get it. So one Saturday, Edward Kimball went to the shoe store where this boy worked. And it was on a Saturday. And he told, told him the importance of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, on that Saturday, in that shoe store, that boy accepted Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. That boy's name was Dwight L. Moody. Dwight Moody led a man by the name of Wilbur Chapman to Jesus. And Chapman became an evangelist, and he had a whole bunch of, of evangelism meetings. And at one of these meetings, a professional ball player came, had the day off. He came to one of these evangelism meetings, and he was led to, to faith in Jesus by Wilbur Chapman. Wilbur Chapman, and that, that guy's name was Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday, he quit professional baseball, and he went uh, on and became an evangelist and was going around uh, with his evangelism meetings, and he led a guy by the name of Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham, he led him to the Lord. Mordecai Ham became an evangelist and went around with gospel meetings, and he stopped in Charlotte, North Carolina. There was a high school boy there that said, I will never go to one of those meetings. Never. Well, a group of boys in high school said, yeah, let's, go, let's get together. Let's go over there. We'll just disrupt this whole thing. This is going to be cool. Let's do that. And, and, and this boy said, okay, I'll go along with that. 
And he went, but he became intrigued with what he heard. And the next day, the next day he went back, or the next night, he went back. And that next night, he accepted Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. That guy's name was Billy Graham. Now, now, you talk about a hard heart? God had prepared it. God had done something in Billy Graham's life. But sowing the seed, if it wasn't for Edward Kimball, sowing to Dwight Moody, who sowed to Wilbur Chapman, who sowed to Billy Sunday, who sowed to Mordecai Ham, who sowed to Billy Graham. Billy Graham presented the gospel, spread more seed around the world than anybody. Even Paul. You can count the apples on a tree, but who can count the apples in a seed? Our job is not to pick and choose the soil we want to sow in. Our job is to sow the seed, period. We're not called to determine the type of soil. We're called to sow seed and not be concerned with where it lands. That is God's job. And I want to close with, with a couple of next steps questions uh, for you. And I want you to answer them to yourself or to me. It doesn't matter. But I want you to answer them. After you take Paul's advice in 1 Corinthians 3.18, Paul says, let no one deceive himself. Be honest in your answers to yourself because I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and take this time to get alone with God and say, Lord, would you send your spirit? Would your Holy Spirit please convict me, Lord? Convict me. Show me where my soil needs to be weeded or needs to be tilled or needs to be deepened. Lord, show me. Convict me. Convict your church. If you've never, never made a commitment to Jesus Christ, today's the day. This is the morning. Today is the day. Pray a prayer like this. Lord, I have made a mess, an absolute mess of things. I need you in my life. Forgive me for my sins. Take over my life. Lord, I need you so bad. In Jesus' name. Maybe you've, been, maybe you've been a believer for a while and things don't seem right or you may be concerned that things are kind of getting off track a little bit. Use this time. Say, Lord, convict me. Lord, show me what I need to do. Then give me the strength and the power to restore and strengthen and support me. Help me, Lord. Father, we thank you. We thank you for, for your son who died for us, for your Holy Spirit who guides us and convicts us and leads us. And Lord, we thank you for your love and your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy. God, we don't understand much of it, but your Holy Spirit helps us piece it together and so, Lord, we thank you for that, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.